Hello, my name is Nigel Dudley. I'm a member of the specialist group of, on privately protected areas and nature stewardship of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas. And I'm one of the contributors to the best practice guidelines being described in these webinars. I've been working on protected area governance and management issues for the last 25 years as part of Equilibrium Research, which is a small consultancy and uh, think tank. This presentation is going to take a look at some of the more unusual types of privately protected areas. Most protected areas, most PPAs are run either by private individuals or by nonprofit organizations and trusts. In other words, they run with the sole aim of conserving nature or perhaps protecting an area of land or water of particular value to a, a person or a family. But not all PPAs fall into this category. Over the next few minutes, I'll be describing some of the other models and showing how they fit into a broader approach to conservation at the landscape and seascape scale. Primary protected areas can also be run by organizations not usually associated in people's minds with conservation. For example, mining or oil companies, tourism operators, this is one of the commonest PPA subgroups, forestry and farming operations, religious bodies and institutions, and finally, areas are sometimes protected for research purposes. So, for example, outside Mombasa in Kenya, the French quarrying company Lafarge runs a privately protected area in part of its lands. Baobab trees, which are considered sacred, have been carefully preserved and forests have been restored in areas, it, it restored it, and forests have been restored in places where operations are complete. There are ponds, tree nurseries, and some captive animals. It's far from wilderness, but it plays an important role in educating youngsters in the region, most of whom don't have the opportunity to visit national parks or otherwise to come across iconic landscape in their region. I had a glimpse of a green mamba when I visited, so shy and alert elusive species of snake confined to the coastal regions of southern and eastern Africa. This is an important area for conservation. Private for-profit ecotourism companies sometimes run their own nature reserves, like this one in Nam Namibia. Guests usually have exclusive visiting rights, and depending on whether or not there are dangerous animals around, can either wander around on their own or take a tour with a guide. Most people who set up ecotourism ventures are themselves interested in conservation. And of course, they also have a commercial incentive in preserving species and keeping the ecosystem in good condition. But there can also be tensions. For example, there might be a temptation to bring in some, bring in too many tourists, so that so many tourists that, that animals become disturbed. Some commercial PPAs are fenced, which makes it easier to control the wildlife. And for example, means that people can come have close access to species that would not be possible if there were large predators present, but also obviously blocks connectivity. Increasingly, the best ecotourism PPA ventures are part of one of the various certification systems available to provide independent verification and, and good management. Excuse me. Although commercial forestry usually falls outside the remit of protected areas, many companies that own large forest areas have places set aside for nature conservation. This may just be because they're commercially uneconomic to exploit, but can also be due to the interest of the forest manager, for example, because the area has particular nature values at old trees, maybe it's a nesting site for rare birds. Under some voluntary certification schemes, like the Forest Stewardship Council, Certified companies are obliged to set aside a certain percentage of their holdings as reserves, usually identified using tools like high conservation value assessment. And if these are set aside permanently, they may also be qualified as, as PPAs, privately protected areas. Religious institutions such as temples, monasteries, and churches are increasingly setting aside some of their lands and waters as PPAs. For example, Rilla Monastery in Bulgaria, in the main picture here, is inside Rilla National Park and the monks coordinate with national park authorities. Similar situations exist in national parks elsewhere, for example, in Spain. 
in uh, Japan and Korea, with concerns for natural world being reflected in all the world's great religions. Even small areas can be important. The grounds of churches in Ethiopia are in some areas the only remnants of the original forest vegetation. Although tiny, uh, they, they are the refuges that are stopping a whole ecosystem from disappearing. Care for nature in this way is today often seen as a positive demonstration of faith. And finally, in our list of different motivations for private conservation, universities and environmental research bodies frequently have areas set aside for research purposes, where students and academics have easy access and the freedom to carry out experiments unhindered by anyone else. Many of these sites are quite small, but they can be amongst the most strictly protected areas in the world. A photograph shows a research reserve in Lithuania, in Europe, one of a network set stretching across Europe, providing the means not only to learn more about the ecology of natural ecosystems, but also as a baseline to chart the changes that are taking place due to climate change, other forms of pollution, or the spread of invasive species. So on to the, the best practices. The first of the associated best practices refers to recognition. Principle 5.1 reads, specific types of PPAs may require tailored forms of recognition, support, and encouragement. Recognizing that each comes with unique aims and values. Best practice 5.1.1 states, encourage companies and other institutions owning or managing PPAs to list them on the World Database on Protected Areas. This is important because it confers public recognition and thus additional security to the area. And best practice 5.1.2 states, investigative partnerships with NGOs, academics, or other specialists to maximize the value of the PPA. Many of the broader constituency of PPA owners we've just talked about will not have the specialized knowledge to practice conservation management. So input from other experts, either hired as consultants or often volunteers, can help fill this gap. Principle 5.2 addresses the particular issue of PPAs owned by commercial co companies outside the ecotourism sector and notes that corporate PPAs offer specific benefits to companies and vice versa. This might, for example, be a personal interest to the company director or a member of the board. Many just decisions like this are very personal, but it also might enhance a company's green credentials to have a reserve, to make use of land owned but no longer used by the company or areas unsuitable for ex exploitation, but particularly valuable for conservation or maybe areas that are undergoing restoration. And although the companies probably won't have conservation expertise unless they are large enough to hire professionals, they do bring other important skills to the table. For example, best practice 5.2.1 recognizes this. Companies and other subtypes of PPAs can deploy strengths such as management skills, capital, financial resilience, and capacity for conservation management. So in these cases, companies aren't just um, partners, they're also some, uh, uh, a group that brings something to the table. Principle 5.3 looks at the particular strengths and potential dangers of some company reserves. PPAs managed by extractive industries must demonstrate contributions to to biodiversity conservation with the accompanying best practice 5.3.1. A PPA managed as part of an extractive operation should be separate from that operation. This might be an area set aside deliberately or in some cases an abandoned quarry, but it needs to be distinct from current operations. So in the Mombasa operation mentioned earlier, there's a working quarry and then a completely separate nature reserve. As noted, PPAs linked to ecotourism can sometimes be split between commercial and conservation priorities. Principle 5.4 shows where the balance should lie. PPAs set up as for-profit company, companies or enterprises should ensure they achieve their specified conservation outcomes. Two best practices build on this. Best practice 5.4.1 states that 
PPAs built as for-profit ventures should develop resilient financial models to ensure sustainable conservation outcomes. The COVID pandemic has highlighted th th this risk. PPAs linked with e ecotourism are always going to be vulnerable to sudden changes due to environmental political factors and need contingency plans. And therefore best practice 5.4.2 notes, any inherent tensions between profit and conservation should be addressed through well articulated objectives. Emphasizing the, the initial planning of a PPA and identifying of its core conservation objectives can help when making hard decisions about commercial decisions or, or conservation. Principle 5.5 looks at religious entities and notes that religious entities can contribute to conservation through developing PPAs on their own land. But many religious bodies may not immediately see conservations within their sphere of influence or their, their interests and can benefit from help and encouragement. So best practice 5.5.1 notes, encourage faith groups to integrate their wider faith objectives with place-based conservation. And the next best practice goes further with advice to support faith groups through active participation, partnership and advice. In, in Bhutan, a meeting of faith leaders and conservationists reached remarkably similar conclusions about conservation and what should be done, even though coming from very different starting points. These wider range of conservation types in PPAs have often been ignored or undervalued, yet they bring non-traditional actors into conservation, which has implications way beyond the lands and waters within the PPA. As conservation moves from niche to mainstream, these more subtle benefits will become ever more important. Thank you. For more information, please see the, the accompanying um, website.